Hello again, everyone. This is Harold Klein with Tom Resorting in Denver, Colorado. I would say good morning, but I think that uh, we're joined globally by several people, so we'll say good day. I'm joined here by uh, the team at Saskatchewan Research Council in Saskatoon, in Canada, and uh, we have a very large turnout today. I apologize if uh, someone got pushed out because of the large registration. But we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a big agenda to make it through. Today, we're going to have three sections. Uh, we'll do a quick introduction to sensor-based sorting. We'll basically start from the beginning, so a little bit of a replay for people who know about sensor-based sorting, but think it's valuable to start from the beginning. We'll talk about specifically applying sensor-based sorting to lithium applications. Uh, then we'll actually jump to Mike McCubbing in Saskatoon, who will cover in more detail how to decide whether sensor-based sorting is really the tool for you and how to make it most effective. Then I'll jump back in and give a few examples specifically to lithium, and we'll have a fairly extensive uh, question and answer session. First of all, where is sensor-based sorting? It's fairly ubiquitous. It's in a lot of places that you wouldn't, recommend, wouldn't uh, recognize. Uh, it's in things like uh, all the food that comes to your table, all those things that you take for recycling have to get separated. And in this case, we're gonna talk about mining applications. For Tamra alone, there are about 200 operating sensor-based sorting installations uh, in various applications. But you can see there are literally thousands and thousands of other sorters operating in other applications. In its most basic sense, sensor-based sorting has three stages. And those are specifically, first of all, particles pass through a sensor or sensors. Then those sensors are used for a classification scheme and we group the particles that the sensors see. So in this case, we have a blue group and a red group and we're gonna separate those two groups either by some sort of mechanical or pneumatic process. These days, uh, it's, handled by air ejectors or solenoids, which are very fast, very reliable, and uh, very well suited. You can see in this case, there are literally hundreds of air ejectors ready to accept particles for separation. There are a number of different sensors. I'm just pointing out the most common ones used in lithium. Color has been uh, on the stage for many, many years. However, as you can imagine, color cameras have gotten much better these days, as has image processing. Laser sorting is the new kid on the block, and we will talk about that a bit. And X-ray transmission is really kind of a workhorse in the mining industry these days. We'll also talk about using XRT for lithium. Then near-infrared spectrometry is also used for lithium. We won't have a lot of time to talk about that today, Perhaps we could do another webinar on that at a later date. So there are two platforms that are commonly used for ore sorting or sensor-based sorting. One is a chute configuration where material comes down a vibrating feeder, spreads out from side to side, and then goes down a chute and spreads out from back to front. The idea is to have a monolayer or a curtain of material that we present during freefall to a sensor or sensors. Then we make a very quick classification and again, separate those into groups, in this case, using air ejectors. The other configuration is material comes down a feeder, spreads out from side to side, then goes down a chute, hits a belt and spreads out. Again, the idea is to have a monolayer that goes underneath, in this case, an X-ray sensor the X-rays go through the rocks, through the belt, to, an, to a sensor underneath the belt. Image processing happens, it's classified into groups, and we make a separation. So there's a lot on this slide, and I apologize, but it's actually to summarize it, it's good to summarize it in one view. So we build different size sensors and different configurations for different applications. The idea is to optimize how we sense the material 
and also how we separate the material. So in the top row, you can see some shoot based sorters. This is used for applications where we need to see both sides of a rock as it falls uh, down the chute. Uh, we have large particles up to 10 inches. We'll talk a little bit whether that's practical. And in this case, we're showing down to two millimeters. Uh, we can go down to about one millimeter, but we'll talk about the implications of that. In the bottom row, you can see common configurations for X-ray transmission. Here we need a nice stable platform, so we use a belt. But again, different size sorters, different engineering for different particle size ranges. Maybe a quick video that illustrates how a sensor-based sorter works. Here we can see a vibratory feeder that helps spread the material so that we get a nice even monolayer of material. Then the material is gonna fall down a chute. The chute is engineered based on the size of the particles that we're sorting. Then as it falls down the chute, there's an opening or a gap. We have a sensor system that images every single rock as it goes by and classifies those. Then there are a group of air ejectors under that. So we make a map of which rock we want to eject, which one we want to keep. And that map determines which air ejector should fire at what time. And we separate the materials into two streams. A quick word about throughput, which is one of the first questions people ask when they're considering using sensor-based sorting. And yes, throughput is indeed a function of almost primarily of particle size range. So the bigger the particle, the higher the throughput. Here we're, we're uh, mapping to metric tons per hour, particle size range in millimeters. Uh, and we're indicating the different sorters in this case, the chute sorters that we showed in the previous screen. So small particles, we would send through a tertiary sorter, mid-range particles through a secondary sorter. This is just our terminology. And for large particles, it would go through a large sorter. As you can imagine, these are individual particles. So not only is the throughput a function of particle size range, so big rocks weigh more, hence a larger throughput in tons per hour, if the rocks weigh more because they're more dense, we have more tons per hour. If we use a wider sorter, we're just looking at more rocks. And then there's something called occupancy. And this is really a function of how complicated the sorting is. For a simple application, we can pack a lot of rocks and discriminate those individually from each other. If it's a complicated separation, we need a little bit of openings or separation between the rocks and hence the occupancy would be lower. Here is a, uh, I always joke that this is like a cocktail party trick, but don't take this than anything more than a rule of thumb. But you can actually estimate what the throughput in tons per hour of your feed will be. If you take the average particle size of your particle size range in millimeters, and multiply times 1.5, you'll get a rough guess for a one meter sorter of what the throughput is. So if we take a look here, just as an example, if the average size is 100 millimeters, we multiply times 1.5, and we get roughly 150 tons per hour. Clearly, it's not linear in the real world, but again, this is just an estimate to get you in the right range. So why spend so much time and effort building different size sorters? There are several very, very good reasons for doing this. One of them just has to do with how the material behaves when we do materials handling. So for instance, small rocks, they roll around with each other, tumble around. We need to actually design the chute appropriately. Also, once the particles become so small, they actually start to adhere to each other. So any moisture, static electricity, 
now all of a sudden they don't behave like independent particles. So we need to account for that. And that's why we really don't go below one or two millimeters for this type of a technique. There's also design criteria, as I mentioned, the shoot has to be different. So there's some engineering involved. We need different sized air ejectors. So if I wanna push big rocks around, I need big air ejectors. If I, but if I use big air ejectors with small rocks, I'm gonna make lots of mistakes. Also, uh, if I look at the physics of the situation, I really need to put the scanner, so the sensor closer to the air ejector to improve the accuracy. There's kind of a side benefit that we take advantage of. So if we're sorting small particles, we know we're gonna have a lower throughput, but what we can do is by building a smaller sorter, we can actually put smaller sorters, more of them together, decrease the footprint and take advantage of the fact that they're small sorters by using more of them. This is a well-known consideration for particle sorting. Uh, all particle sorters like this work best when the size ratio between the largest and the smallest particle is in about a three to one ratio. So for example, if my top size is three inches, it's most effective if I go down to about one inch. So if I use large air ejectors and I have small particles, I'm gonna make lots of mistakes, but notice also that mixed particle size ranges means that particles can be overlapping with each other. And this also causes more errors. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit, but the, the, the flow sheet for sorting looks something like, obviously I'm gonna do some comminution, some crushing. Uh, I'm gonna do some screening. The screening is to actually get the right particle size range. It's really important to remove fines and also to remove oversized materials. Then if I'm doing color sorting, I need to be able to see the surface of the particle for it to work effectively. So I'm gonna go through several steps here and actually we'll lead into the, the SRC presentation. Um, there are several guidelines we can follow that will make sorting more effective. And the number one need and my, the, the number one reason in my mind is that you need to have a problem to solve. You have some need, something that you need to be successful at in order for sorting to be effective. So I'm really generalizing here, but basically most lithium processing flow sheets look something like this. There's crushing, screening, you're gonna do some flotation, thickening and shipping. The problem with this process is that uh, we can get very poor spodumene recovery. And we'll talk about what the reasons are for that. But this is where we're gonna target sorting to see if we can be more effective with the separation there are a number of different uh, mineralogies involved with lithium. We're gonna focus on just one today, and that's gonna be spodumene. So we're gonna pick an example. This is from some public data. Uh, this is actually the Piedmont project in the United States. If we take a look at the mineralogy here, it's almost entirely spodumene. And so this is the type of example that we're gonna focus on just for this seminar today. We take a close look at what that material, the mineralogy looks like. In this case, there are four primary components, one being basalt, one being spodumene, and one being felsic or quartz type material. A common problem is that iron, especially uh, minerals like basalt are high in iron and they occur with the deposit. And these are actually toxic to the processing of lithium. So if that's the need that we have identified, we need to remove that basalt or the high iron content material. Next, we need a strategy to achieve that. And if you've watched any of our uh, presentations before, we sort of narrow down into four strategies that are common with ore sorting. And with this type of an approach, 
what we're really going to do is focus on not the spodumene, but focus on removing the waste material. In, these, in this case, it's the high iron content material, um, basically the basalt. Uh, there are other approaches. In one approach, we could target the product material itself. In another approach, we could target some associated mineralogy. In another approach, we're not really looking at removing things, but actually creating different products at different grade. This is very common with industrial minerals. But again, today we're gonna to focus on removing waste material from the feed. Okay, now that we understand that, our strategy is we wanna remove the basalt particles. Notice they're dark black and the other part of the feed is white. So we should be able to take advantage of that. Uh, the next thing now that we have a strategy is can we come up with some sort of sensor that will now achieve that strategy? The most obvious one would be color sorting. Let's just remove the black material from the white material. So in this case, as we showed with the shoot based sorter, material is in free fall. It's going to go past a sensor, in this case, a color camera. Uh, these days, we can choose between different color cameras different resolution based on what the need is. But as the material falls, we're going to have a line scan camera. In the case that uh, I chose, it's about 3,000 lines per second that's scanning the material as it goes by. And in this case, it has 0.6 millimeter resolution. So if I look at a 6 millimeter particle here, I'm going to get about 10 pixels by 10 pixels roughly of this, uh, this particle that I can try to classify. And again, I'm going to classify it using some sort of a color model. In the example that I'm talking about, we'll just use a red, green, blue, because that's pretty straightforward. So if you remember your high school physics, light is composed of, uh, our, in our case, the illumination is composed of uh, white light, which is composed of many different wavelengths. What we're going to do is we're going to collect data in three different channels basically a blue channel, a green channel, and a red channel. And so we'll collect photons in a range there, try to get a high enough signal to noise ratio to make a good classification. So if I just start to plot pixels or points that we collect, uh, if I take a look at an example here, here's a particle, it's got a certain red, green, blue value, and I, point, I plot that in color space. If I just plot all of the pixels that I'm collecting as the rock falls by, here are the names we might call those. But what I really want to do is look for some sort of mapping in color space. It's a good application if I, good, if I have a good separation. In our, case, in our case, we had black material and we had white material. Notice there's a nice big separation between those two and I should be able to come up with a good classification. Um, a lot of times people uh, will try to use things a little bit more solar, subtle with color sorting. Uh, it is possible, but uh, I, would pro I would propose that you're not gonna get as good a separation. Uh, you know, I have a bluish cyan material that I wanna separate from a bluish magenta material. Uh, if you can see it with your eye, there's a chance that the camera can do it but why not give the camera a good chance to have a good separation? So I think it's good to have good separated classes. So what we do is as every rock passes by, we apply that color model and we say whenever the colors, for instance, in this case, fall in the white class, in this case, I've colored them white. Whenever they fall in the waste class, we've colored them red, but basically consider this a map as material is falling. These are red objects and white objects. So I make a map and say, whenever this object comes by, I want to fire these air ejectors at this time in the range of uh, milliseconds here. And I'll fire it for several milliseconds. And then I'm going to release those valves and be ready for the next rock to come by. One very important note that I'll mention a couple times is that color sorting, near-infrared sorting, and laser sorting rely on us being able to see the surface of the rock. 
which means that we actually need to wash the rock. So not only do we see the surface, but it actually, by wetting the material, just like when you see rocks in a stream, the colors actually get accentuated. So for instance, this rock here would be misclassified if we did not wet and wash the material. So let's take a quick look at a very, very simple sorting flow sheet. Of course, first we'll have run of mine material coming in. We're gonna do whatever stages of crushing are necessary to get a good separation. We're gonna do some screening. This is critical in sorting to remove not only fines, which are gonna remove the performance uh, of the sorter. And also we wanna get rid of any big rocks that could physically damage the sorter. Uh, once we screen it, if we wash it, in this case, we're gonna to go to two banks of sorters. Remember we mentioned our rule about a three to one ratio. So in this case, there's one range that's going 50 to 40 millimeters. That'll go to two sorters in order to meet our throughput needs. Then there are two sorters that will handle the 40 to 100 millimeter range. The waste rock will bypass the rest of the processing and anything that passes the sorters will go on. So notice the nice thing is we're not sending everything to the rest of the wet processing plant. How about another approach? Again, we wanna remove these black particles, the dark particles, while they actually have, iron has a higher atomic density than a silica-based rock would. So what if we take advantage of the fact that X-rays would be able to actually separate those materials? Let's take a quick look at how a belt-based sorter works. Again, critical to have a vibratory feeder that spreads the material so that we get a nice imaging bed. We wanna to try to get a monolayer of material so we can see every rock. Then the rocks are gonna go down an, an engineered chute and basically try to get up to speed and spread out from back to front at about three meters per second or so, they're gonna pass underneath an X-ray source, a tube. The X-rays are gonna go through the rocks, through the belt to a sensor underneath the belt. Then just like the shoot base sorter, we're gonna do some image processing based on the physical characteristics, in this case, atomic density, we're gonna make a map of which rocks are where. So rocks that we want to eject, <clears throat> rocks that we want to keep. We'll make a map of those and then eject the ones that we want to get rid of. Notice the bank of several hundred uh, air ejectors here to make that separation. So how does this all work? I'm sure you've heard the term dual energy x-ray. You may hear that again. It doesn't mean that we have two x-ray sources. We actually have one x-ray source. We take two images. At the same time, we basically filter the x-rays. So we get a low energy and a high energy. We do some image processing. And again, we make a classification. So in this case, by convention, low atomic density materials get mapped red. Blue atomic density material gets mapped blue. So what can we change here? Well, basically we can affect how many blue pixels we get, how many red pixels we get, we can also make a decision, for instance, notice this rock. Uh, we can make decisions like whenever I see more than make up a number of 15% high density, I want to keep that specific rock. If we do that with spodumene versus basalt, uh, why do we want to use XRT? Well, first of all, because it works. Notice it's almost black and white, in this case, red and blue. The low atomic density spodumene versus the high atomic waste. Uh, very clear separation. When do we want to do this? When the DMS, uh, DMS again being a very common processing technique, uh, if the cut point is really close between the spodumene and other material we want to separate, there's a chance that x-ray transmission is going to work better. And here's a big point. We just talked about color sorting. We need to wash the material for color sorting. X-rays don't care about uh, some material on the surface of the rocks, they'll see right through it. So in this case, a wash plant is not required. 
So going back to our steps for successful sorting, now we've identified the need, we have the strategy, we can pick the sensor that works best. There's one thing that is very critical, and this is common for all mineral processing. Uh, my professor always said, separate before you liberate, or separate, excuse me, liberate before you separate. And so uh, just a quick discussion about that. Uh, I've actually stolen this, uh, this schematic directly from Chris Robbins' PhD dissertation. I think it's really one of the best explanations uh, in a simple way. So we have different rows of rocks here. In the top row, notice we have perfect liberation. So we have product in the white, we have waste in black. This is probably the perfect situation for ore sorting. So if I map that number one to a grade recovery curve uh, over on the right, notice that within five rocks, so 50% of the material, I've actually recovered 100%. So this is, the, this is a perfect case for ore sorting. Let's look at the opposite case in this bottom row here, where we do not have good liberation. So we have waste and product in every single rock. In order to get 100% recovery, I have to actually get 100% of the rocks to get that 100% recovery. This is a horrible situation for ore sorting and would, I would never recommend ore sorting. Uh, another case, this could happen not, not just for the liberation, but uh, let's say it's disseminated material. So I really have no heterogeneity. So the, the ore material is basically sprinkled in every rock. No matter how much I try to liberate it, I'm still going to have the situation with the curve on the bottom here, curve number five, where I have to use, get all of the rocks to get all of the material. Of course, in the real world, it's probably going to be somewhere in between. So you see the different uh, recovery curves here. But basically, the take home message is in order for sorting to work, I need to have heterogeneity and I have to have liberation at the right scale for what I'm trying to separate. There's always a temptation. You now, we looked at that uh, throughput curve. If I just sort bigger and bigger and bigger rocks, I'm going to get higher and higher and higher throughput. The problem is I'm not now experiencing good liberation. So I have a high throughput, but I'm not really accomplishing anything. So that needs to be weighed. You know, at what stage do I get a good liberation and a good throughput? It's always a trade-off, but this is true with every mineral processing technique. And with that, as long as we have a good business case, then sorting could be a good tool for you. And now I'm actually going to hand off to Mike McCubbing, who's going to talk about uh, some of the aspects of evaluating your mineralogy and seeing if it's a good, uh, good case for sorting. So Mike, I'm going to hand off to you. Thanks, Harold. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us today. I'm just going to share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see that. So just to pick up where uh, Harold has, has left off, um, I'm going to give you a quick introduction about uh, the Saskatchewan Research Council, and we'll get into our test work methodology for, for sensor-based sorting uh, in, a, in a lithium application. So a bit of an overview, if you're not familiar with the Saskatchewan Research Council, it's the uh, second largest research and technology organization in Canada. Um, we've been working with industry and government communities all over the world for over 75 years. Uh, it's, it's part of the Treasury Board uh, and is a, is a classified crown corporation governed by the Research Council Act. Um, so it's independent, has an independent board of directors and uh, is accountable to the, the minister responsible for SRC. Uh, so again, uh, just over 277 million uh, in annual revenue, and this is back in 2021, 22. Uh, but again, over 75 years in in uh, applied research and, and development, um, with a, a lot of experience in remediation. 
Our headquarters is, is based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. We also have offices in Regina and Uranium City. The Uranium City office uh, is, is primarily uh, focused on the radiation projects in the northern part of Saskatchewan. And so why is sensor-based sorting test work uh, Im important? Um, so I guess going back to Harold's um, presentation and how you classify the ore to determine whether or not sensor-based sorting is applicable and what sensor is the, is the right uh, type of sensor for your given application. Um, here today, we're gonna look at lithium, um, but what SRC brings to the table is, uh, is is the kind of methodological methodological approach where we base everything on the physical mineral properties. Uh, and so you get quantitative data uh, that helps support the, uh, the outcomes that the sorter is providing. And so those will work in tandem back and forth to develop a, a program and, and validate that particular program uh, for its effectiveness in determining what your uh, thresholds are and potential yield and validation for that, uh, uh, that equipment when you're scaling up and doing pre feasibility studies. Uh, and so you can do that from, from small scale applications just to get an initial indication of whether or not there's a contrast available for sensor based sorting. And here we have a couple of examples of this is a Kimberlite. You can see we used a CT scanner to, to look at the density of that uh, particular ore, uh, and we're showing some uh, higher density particles within that kimberlite that you can use to uh, exploit XRT as a viable source of, of uh, separating that material. Uh, and here's another uh, example of how we've integrated our microanalysis uh, center and the information that we can capture uh, from the equipment in that department uh, to overlay on a, on a particular ore uh, from the mineralogy. And so you've got a high resolution uh, imaging on top of the, uh, the image of the ore itself to, to know exactly where the ore is hosted and what mineral assemblages it might be associated with. Uh, and once you compound that, it, it actually gets you a, a theoretical and an actual data that can be used uh, for, for future modeling and, and, uh, and development. So we've put that into a three-stage uh, test work application approach. Um, if you start uh, with our first stage, which is mineral characterization, where you're looking at that target assemblage, uh, and then we define the particle homogeneity factor, or HF, just to, just to say it a little bit easier. Uh, and then we'll also determine what the optimal sorting size is, uh, because as Harold was, was mentioning, you want to make sure that you've, uh, that you've got that liberation factor identified uh, for the best benefit of, of beneficiation and, and separation. Uh, and then we'll also be able to define which sensor type is going to be most applicable depending on the, the type of contrast that you're seeing uh, from, the, from the feedback. To do that type of test work, we don't need a lot of material. It's, it's only a few kilograms to start with. Um, but again, the amount of data that you get that from that um, will be useful. Uh, but obviously not uh, to a point where you can you could get a pre-feasibility uh, report together to, to validate that model. Uh, but as you get uh, down into stage two and stage three, uh, the amount of information that you get increases, uh, and then you can in get increasing confidence uh, in how that model develops and how you integrate the sensor-based sorting into your into your flow sheet. And obviously with that, representativity becomes uh, an important factor. And so the sample size would also have to increase as you validate the model going through the, the different phases of, of test work. Um, throughout that program, we've got uh, several client decision points uh, to again, verify what the optimal parameters and what the, uh, the goals of the project are as far as cutoff grades and, and potential yields that works in that particular uh, flow sheet design. And so it's an interactive process that we offer uh, back and forth from, from the customer with SRC, uh, working with, with Tomra and the equipment suppliers uh, to, to make sure that we're getting a, a good solution. So the first step in, in stage one is, is actually getting the mineral characterized. Uh, and so the goal of this is to identify that mineral assemblage that's ideal for, for particle size uh, and, and for sensor-based sorting. Um, and so here you can again see uh, an image of uh, a slab that we've, we've uh, 
uh, produced or, or uh, cut and polished uh, for the, uh, the quantum scan to get that digital imaging. Uh, and it's like a thin section that we, that we overlay to, to look at the, the mineral assemblage and, and those associated uh, uh, ore deposits with the host rocks. Now back into lithium uh, mineralogy specifically. Um, so lithium is incompatible and concentrates in late stage crystall crystallization. Um, uh, and the most common example is, is in pegmatites. Um, so we've got over 120 mineral species and, and counting that do contain lithium. And obviously the most common uh, includes spodumene, which we're going to focus in on today, albite, trifolite, and bligonite, and lithiophorite. Um, some of the issues that we've got um, is the high proportion of lithium minerals can occur in just a single location, uh, and they can be hard to uh, visually identify with the surrounding uh, rocks and minerals. Uh, and so also lithium is hard to analyze by traditional x-ray instruments. So here we've got the digital thin section of, of a spodumene. Uh, and so you can see on uh, a micron scale, we've got this mineral characterized. And then if you go one step further, you can then isolate and look at the spodumene. Um, so this is the purple ore. We can use this target mineral assemblage and identify and, and visualize using the automated mineralogy or QEM scan in the Saskatchewan Research Council's case. Uh, and you can identify the high grade, uh, low grade and middling and barren samples. So homogeneity and sortability um, so the interparticle heterogeneity is required uh, for separating waste from more, as Harold had mentioned, where intraparticle homogeneity is required for sorting. Um, homogeneity is defined by the spatial distribution of the target mineral assemblage, uh, which may be composed of one or more minerals. Higher particle homogeneity gives a consistent, more predictable sense of response. And the HF factor is a single dimension parameter that SRC has developed for quantifying that proportion of the most abundant mineral relative to the total number of unique minerals and total number of interconnected mineral domains. That's a mouthful, which is why I wrote it out. Um, so homogene homogeneity usually increases with increasing particle size. And so we've determined that that we take three factors into consideration when uh, quantifying homogeneity. Uh, so the percentage of the dominant mineral, the number of different mineral grains, and the number of individual mineral grains in that particular sample. Uh, and so sampling is obviously very important to ensure the, that representativity. Uh, and, and as we get further and further down the, the testing regime, uh, that will then feed back into, uh, into the modeling and, and the information that's provided. Uh, so here's the equation that's used to determine that uh, H factor. So here's two examples of uh, the, uh, two uh, mineral sections. Um, the one on the left here shows high homogeneity. Uh, you've got primarily orthoclase with some albite uh, and maybe some quartz up in the corner here. And here's low homogeneity where you've got a lot of quartz, your purple spodumene again, uh, some albite members, and also some muscovite and orthoclase, uh, and maybe a, a few uh, uh, assemblages of, of uh, appetite. And if you apply the homogeneity factor, here we have a very high homogeneity factor of 42, and here is slightly lower at, at 23. Uh, and so how we then use that to determine particle size is by providing that with a grid. Uh, and so as you overlay these grid lines on that mineral section, you can start to isolate exactly within that particular section and here, in this case, it's 20 millimeters, has a low homogeneity factor of 9.8. You've got a lot of different minerals within that square that contributes to that uh, load H factor. And as we decrease, increase the grid space or decrease the grid spacing from 10 millimeters down to one millimeter, you can see that H factor then increases uh, with, with one. If you look at one of these single grid patterns, it's almost all pink. Uh, or almost all purple in these cases with very few of these uh, containing uh, multiple mineral assemblages. Uh, and so that then constitutes to a very high H factor, 90.3. Um, so what we've determined as uh, an H factor of, of greater than 40 is, is optimal for sorting. Uh, and in this case, about a 10 millimeter grid pattern. 
what this doesn't take into consideration is your uh, liberation. And obviously, uh, when you crush this rock, uh, it's going to liberate on different grain boundaries than these perfect grids. But this will give you a, a good example on what the, the potential is for that ore as you uh, start to isolate those, those mineral grains for, uh, for potential for sorting. At the end of stage one, with the characterization, uh, we'll be able to deliver a characterization table. And so with the spodumene ore, we've got here all the examples of the minerals that uh, were identified in that uh, thin section, uh, that digital section, and what we classify it as between ore or waste rock, the chemical formula, the modal percentage, and in this case, high modal percentage of spodumene and quartz, the average range uh, in the size of the, the crystals of those particular mineral assemblages, and the major associations. Uh, here's the uh, mineral groups, the approximate lithium percentage, 3.7%, that's based on the assays, uh, and the other mineral character properties like hardness, um, some color. As you can see, most of these are colorless to white, which we'll get into uh, down the line with um, some of them like orthoclase as, as a pink or the garnet as a red, um, which then lends itself to either color sorting, um, but that's what will be evaluated unless we can start to identify a, a higher range of, of these, these grayscales that can, that can present themselves, and also the atomic density of those particular minerals. Um, here we have spodumene at 1.01, uh, and that is a very lower, uh, on the lower end of the atomic density. Uh, other uh, mineral properties that will also be identified through the, the, the results of these characterization tables, uh, luster, transparency, uh, luminescence, which could also lend itself to a uh, potential uh, contrast for, for uh, identification for sorting, and whether or not magnetic susceptibility uh, also plays in for, for a magnetic separation. And so you've got a lot of tools here to be able to make decisions on what you then take forward to your next step of, of test work and, and diagnostics. Which leads us to the end of the stage one, which requires a decision. Uh, so the customer decision will, will then play into what, uh, what's our target mineral, uh, the, the potential sorting applications that might apply, and then the, based on the sensor responses of each mineral and the homogeneity factor, that will start to define a test work criteria to then test the sorters themselves. Next step is to actually separate the spodumene. Um, so here we've been determined whether or not dense media separation is, is viable, which is feasible um, and is used in, in applications for pre-concentration. XRT also feasible based on the contrasting uh, atomic density ranges. Uh, color, there was some variation, but could be difficult. Uh, luminescence, again, feasible. NIR, possible, but could require more testing and magnetics may provide little benefit. Stage two. Uh, which would then take that information forward uh, where we get the inspection tests and start to develop some models and, and define the algorithm parameters. Uh, so now we're looking at larger sample sizes, um, 100 to 1,000 kilograms, uh, again, representing different zones or different lithologies within that unit to make sure that we've got uh, uh, statistically uh, significant samples. Uh, and then we'll take that into the sorting efficiency of the identified technology. Um, the outcome of this uh, second stage is to start developing a semi-empirical sorting model that can be used by the customer to build flow sheets and test different scenarios as we provide feedback into the model using uh, the, the empirical data that comes out of the, the test work program. Uh, and that'll, again, get more refined as we provide more sample. And the data is gathered from that sort of first inspection and the characterization results. So here's our example of our lithium bearing pegmatite. As you can see, these samples have been hand sorted um, by, by geologists on staff at, uh, at SRC. Uh, in the first row here, we've got some spodumene. Um, here's more some smoky quartz, some orthoclase feldspar, which is a bit lighter color and uh, visually distinguishable, and then some mica. But you can see between the spodumene quartz and feldspar, all fairly grayscale um, uh, minerals, uh, not a clear distinction, but enough that maybe potential uh, for color sorting. And so we'll look at color calibration first. Uh, and so we'll use that high resolution color camera uh, to define those RGB criteria. 
Uh, you can use over 30,000 color categories uh, to, to set those thresholds, and then we'll compare those to the assays to define what the acceptance is. Uh, and so you can see how we've defined a bunch of different grayscale images based on each one of those mineral samples that we've uh, that we've uh, scanned. And so both both sides of the rock is uh, fragmented and scanned. The data is then translated into a model for decision making. Uh, but you can see again with these subtle grayscale images, it's not like your uh, example with with Harold where you've got basalt. And, and the spodumene, which is a high contrasting ore, uh, that might be a, a more amenable for color sorting. But with this example, uh, with the subtleties, uh, there might be a secondary application that might be more suitable. And so we'll test XRT. Uh, and so here's those same minerals uh, with the inspection test. So here's your spodumene, quartz, feldspar, and mica. Uh, and so this is the combined dual image. Uh, and so under the X-ray, you don't see a lot of difference between each one of those minerals. But as we classify them, they'll start to identify themselves as, as sortable images. So they'll get classified. And here we have our, our spodumene, our quartz, our uh, feldspar, and our mica. And you can see our clear contrast between high density and low density rocks. Here's a closer look at spodumene. Uh, again, our, our X-ray generated image. Um, and this green image just is defining the rocks as an object uh, to be sorted, and then the classified image. Uh, and so here's the, the actual photo of that, that spodumene ore. And again, you can see small lenses of high density uh, material in with the low density uh, spodumene. Uh, and so you can define that accepted criteria that if if it, a certain percentage of that material is, is uh, low density that you can either classify it to sort it or not to sort it. Um, and so another example with, the, with your quartz, uh, again, classified as a uh, low density with some high density lenses within that. Into your feldspars, uh, again, the object list. Here, these are defined as mostly high density. Uh, and so they'll uh, get classified into waste. And then the muscovite um, and so your micas again here we have a small lens of, of low density uh, and so this particle if it's showing 70 percent low density and or 70 percent high density and 30 percent low density we can set that as a threshold that if it shows any of this low density material that it won't sort that material out or will accept that material into your concentrate the outcome of this is to deliver uh, a model uh, that can be used for doing those determinations on, on sorting efficiency and acceptance criteria. Uh, and so here we have an adjustable grade cutoff. And so we'll be able to provide that sorting matrix through that test work regime where we'll test all of the specific uh, thresholds, so 10%, 20%, 30% acceptance. And then we'll be able to assay those splits uh, to get an acceptable yield that you can feed back into this model. Uh, so here's an example of your grade cutoff of 0.07%. Uh, and then with those cascading tests, we'll feed those back into the model uh, and the resulting splits are used to calibrate it. In this case, we have a feed grade of 0.88 weight percent lithium, a feed mass of about 100 kilograms. And you can see the sorting efficiency of 85% with a lithium recovery of 12 point run. So your upgrade potential for that particular test is over 300%. Uh, and so anything less than 0.07% will go to your rejects. Anything above 0.7%, 0.07% will get accepted. Uh, and here's your mass splits. So your reject mass is 62%. So quite efficient and a good way of, of pre-concentrating your, your ore if you're removing 60%, 60 over 60% of your waste material. So at the end of stage two, uh, again, this is a decision point. What are the optimal mass pulls uh, and grade cutoffs? And so we work with the customer to adjust that design criteria and refine the model for scaled test work uh, and, and kind of play with those numbers and, and figure out exactly wh what, uh, uh, what the optimal uh, cutoffs are. And then we'll go into full scale pilot testing. Uh, and this is where we're doing large volume testing 
um, over a thousand kilos on, on specific units based on that acceptance criteria to demonstrate that those particular yields are achievable in full scale testing. Uh, and so if it's at 30 millimeters, we can run 30 tons an hour and achieve those same yields that we did in those uh, lab and, and uh, uh, bench scale and pilot scale test work. Um, and so we'll refine that algorithm and then you'll be left with uh, a, a model at the end of the process that you can use to then calculate how many sorters and the uh, the overall efficiency of that equipment. Um, and so here we'll we'll gauge uh, performance, so real versus the model, your throughput and yield. We'll optimize that entire flow sheet, and then this is where the amount of data uh, then really gets refined on whether or not we do uh, a thousand kilograms, uh, if that's representative, or up to. Uh, 100,000 kilograms over 100 tons uh, to, to make sure that that model is refined. Uh, at the end of it, the mineral characterization, uh, it can provide first indications of sortability even with smaller sample sizes. Uh, that test work combined with an assay can be used to develop that semi-empirical model and as that, uh, as we develop through that flow sheet, uh, that will become more evolved and more refined. Uh, you'll have more confidence in those numbers. Uh, so you can do that scaled test work uh, to, to provide validation for the flow sheet design. And then that quantitative data and modeling can then be used for feasibility studies and compliance reporting. Um, so again, the benefits of, of sensor-based sorting at, at SRC is we are independent. Uh, we work with equipment suppliers like Tamra, we work with, uh, with contractors, uh, and we have on-site analysis with our, our geoanalytical laboratories, and we have a lot of experience uh, with our mineral processing team in crushing, sizing, and downstream hydrometallurgy that we can provide solutions all the way through from pre-concentration uh, to, uh, to, to final concentration. and some contacts for myself and, and Lucinda Wood, uh, who can provide more information as, as needed. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'll hand it back over to Harold uh, for, for the last bit of our, our presentation today. Thanks, Mike. Now to, uh, to pick up and maybe just talk about a couple of examples. Just a reminder, in our particular case, we're looking at removing this high iron content material from the feed. Uh, in our case, we could start with the DMS or we could try to separate before DMS, but uh, the take home message is it's good to evaluate in your lithium processing, whether you can replace part of the DMS with sorting, whether you need to use them together, uh, what actually is gonna achieve your business objective. Here are a couple of examples from the test center. So this is actual customer material. Here's a simple color sort. You can see in this first pass, we've done a fairly decent job of removing the high iron content material. Uh, it is the real world. There's still some black specks in here. It all depends on what the goal of the sorting is. Let's take it some typical, sorry, this is uh, XRT sorting, my mistake there. So maybe a little bit better in this case, but I want to use this one to talk about goals. So again, as Mike mentioned, we're beyond the stage where we've selected what sensor is going to work best, and we're looking at real world performance. And here it's good to talk about the business case and what the goal is. Are we trying to increase grade to a certain goal? Are we trying to maximize recover? recovery, because those kind of interplay with each other. So let's uh, say in our case, we need to achieve a very high grade. When we do that, we're actually going to eject some white material. So notice on the right hand side in the waste, we've actually gotten rid of some material It might have been not fully liberated. Or it might actually be a mechanical mistake because those particles were too close together. But our whole goal was to increase the grade of the product on the left. So in this case, we're actually willing to tolerate that material loss. It all comes down to a business case, uh, which is why we do the real world testing. However, let's say that recovery was important. If recovery is actually the goal, then we would accept actually probably more of the dark material into the left-hand side sorted spodumene 
because we want to actually recover as much spodumene as possible. Uh, this is always an interplay and it's why real world test work is important. And it's always a question, uh, how efficient is the sorting? How accurate is the sorting? Uh, one way to take a look at that is to evaluate after the sorting, how much product you're getting in the waste versus how much waste you're getting in the product. So in this table, we've actually manually taken a look at white particles versus black particles and where they're occurring. Uh, you can see in this first row, uh, three, we've lost 3.6% just visually of the material into the waste. So 96% of the white particles went where they should have gone and 3.6% went where they shouldn't have gone. Uh, same thing, looking at waste in product. In this case, uh, black particles did go into the concentrate, about 7.3% of them, and 92% did go where they were supposed to go. Again, this is driven in the real world by your business model. You know, what is the trade-off? What recovery do you need? And, you know, what, what kind of tolerance of waste particles can you tolerate? Quickly, here's an example of, again, where sorting would fit in a flow sheet. This, again, is from Piedmont, some published material. Very simply, notice the sorting happens after the crushing. Uh, how much crushing is necessary depends on liberation. Uh, once you get a good liberation, then some screening. The fine materials will bypass the sorter, and the material that uh, is suitable for sorting would go through the sorter. So the whole idea is to limit the amount of crushing that does need to happen, limit the amount of material that goes to other parts of the process, uh, to more DMS or more magnetic separation, but basically to try to take care of that at a course of particle size. Quick example from Western Australia. From an operations perspective, to actually physically run the Tomer is really, really simple. Basically just a quick clean, you're in and out within five to 10 minutes and you're back online again. So that also helps us maintain a really high level of utilizations and run time. In terms of maintenance, it's quite basic. We were able to establish a preventative maintenance schedule very, very quickly owing to Tomer's support. They gave us a lot of the documentation ahead of time, so we knew what we were coming into before we even started. From the Tomra laser sorter, the level of performance we've seen has far exceeded our expectations and a lot of the guarantees they've given us as well. It's extremely consistent, which makes it beneficial for us because we can predict its behavior and the product we're going to get out of it. We have sections of contaminated ore, which has a high basalt content in it. Unfortunately, our processing plant is not able to remove the basalt from the product therefore diluting the final grade of our product. Utilising the tomera to remove the basalt before it is fed into the wet processing plant 
enables us to provide it with a clean product, therefore increasing our product grade on the other end. Yeah, I'm sure you're getting used to this story. We've chosen these examples to sort of focus on one application, which is removing high iron content from the feed. So same story again, they have the salt contamination. They wanna preserve as much spodumene as possible while removing the iron. Uh, unfortunately for DMS, the specific gravity of the product and the basalt were very similar. And so they never quite achieved the specifications that they needed to. So I'm gonna quickly mention another sorting sensor technique. Uh, in this case, it's called laser sorting. Uh, this is very unique to Tamra. We use actually multiple lasers, uh, the, and I'll explain why in a bit, but each laser color uh, is scanned across the material to preserve the high power of the laser. Uh, quite quickly, as the material passes by, we, we uh, then detect the, the signal that's coming back from the lasers. Each color goes to its own sensor, and we measure, measure the signal back to each laser sensor. This allows us to actually use multiple lasers and decide which ones are most effective for whatever the strategy or whatever we're trying to achieve. This warrants a presentation of its own, but I'm gonna just quickly mention, we'll say something about scatter and anti-scatter. It just has to do with what part of the returning laser signal that we're gonna detect so that you'll know what we're talking about in the next section here. So here is a, a quick plot of some laser results using multi-laser channels. Uh, we're using, in this case, green, red, and infrared, and the filters that we mentioned before, scatter and anti-scatter. And so the, to, the way to use this particular plot is that you know, no laser signal means that the plot would be zero towards the center. The higher the intensity of return from each channel, the farther out on this spider diagram it would appear. So if we plot then the response from these different laser channels for spodumene in green and basalt in blue, notice for channels one, four, and six, the responses are very similar which means those are not really useful for classifying different materials. So the basalt from the spodumene. However, if we look at the red, both the scatter and the anti-scatter, they're quite different between the two materials. And the same for uh, channel, sorry, channel five, it's also very different. So this means these could be useful for actually classifying the material. If we do things in that way, separating the basalt from the lithium, we get this type of results. Uh, they're sorting, pardon me, they're sorting in two size fractions. So the small size fraction, the basalt content is significantly and uh, very consistently below 3%. And if we look at the larger size fraction, the basalt, we can actually get below 1%. So very good liberation at that particle size range. So they lose about 3.5% of the spodumene while getting rid of that toxic iron for the large particle size. They lose about 6% of the product uh, while achieving less than 3% iron content. Again, the feed rates for the coarse particle size range about 80 tons per hour and for the small particle size range, 25 to 50 tons per hour. Uh, overall, again, this is the need. They needed to get the iron much less consistently than they were achieving. Uh, this site had actually tried color sorting before and were never able to consistently uh, achieve the specifications. So in this case, because of real world considerations and the, the new abilities of the laser system, they were able to use the laser sorting. Just a quick aside, I just wanna point out uh, 
some other uses possible for the laser system. Uh, if we look at our famous picture here, uh, we've talked about removing the basalt with the high iron content. What if I actually want to get the grade of the spodumene up by removing the felspar and the quartz product? So let's take a look at whether we might be able to achieve that with the multi-channel laser. So again, we take a look at our spider diagram. So we have three materials we're looking at. So the felspars, the quartz, and the waste rock. Is there any way we can actually separate those from each other? If we use our spider diagram, we see that for three of the channels, those signals are very close to each other. But if we look at some of the other channels, there's a nice separation between the products using the different laser channels. So this gives us an indication that we might be able to separate the quartz, the felspar from other waste rock. If we take a look at a quick uh, schematic of how that might look, we have three materials, quartz, felspar, and in this case, a generic waste rock. If we look at the infrared scatter on the quartz material, there's basically no signal. So if I color that classification red, the red scatter, if I color that green, and the red anti-scatter, if I color that blue, if I look at the classified image, you can see all the signal comes from the red, the red scatter signal. And so if I then map that, I see that I get a nice green classified image. But not uh, important what color it is, but the important part is we can actually separate these three materials by using multiple laser channels. Uh, this is fairly new, something that we've actually been experimenting with. So could be something uh, that could be useful for customers. I just want to mention that uh, the reference for what I talked about for the laser sorting here is from a presentation that Chris Corcoran gave at Canadian Mineral Processors Conference this year in Ottawa. Uh, it, it's possible to get that whole presentation or we could do another webinar just on multi-channel laser sorting. Just a contact for questions. And I think that there are quite a few questions. So I'm actually gonna jump over and open the floor for questions. Tobias, if you could help us with that. Uh, sorry, just to, to introduce other people that are on the line. So Mike and Jane, uh, and sorry, someone else from SRC is probably on the line to help us answer questions. Uh, do you want me to take that question or would you like to? You can take that question, Harold. All right. So, Steve, did you want to take that question? So the question is, is a good one. Uh, however, not really the focus of sensor-based sorting. So we're not actually detecting different isotopes. Uh, as we pointed out in our case, the goal was to actually remove high iron content material. Uh, there could be other types of goals with, the, uh, with different types of felspar deposits. However, we're not really looking for different isotopes or trying to separate those in any way. So it's not really just not something that customers have asked for before. And uh, radiometric sensing for business reasons is something that we just don't implement that. Uh, it would, it would uh, just not, it would detract from the, what we're trying to achieve at hand. Can, I can take that one. Uh, we can, and we've actually looked at it before. Uh, with very high barite concentrations, uh, it's difficult with x-rays to actually tell the difference between 4.0, 4.5. In that case, I would probably use a more traditional gravity separation or dense media separation where I could actually tune the media and get a better separation it's just you know, high atomic density material is high atomic density material to x-ray sorter. Any comment, Jane? 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to say specific density is different to atomic density. So if something is different in specific density, it doesn't mean that they're going to be different in atomic density and vice versa, which is why there are two different technologies and where one doesn't work, you can look at the other technology as an alternative because they do work on different criteria. Excellent point. Again, it depends on the liberation size. Uh, I can just do the our our quick. Uh, sorry, can you give me the sizes again, Tobias? Yeah, crush size at say forty ton per hour. Drop it. Divide by one point five. Uh, I think that's out of the scope of our presentation here. I think we're talking more about technical separation. There are some groups that uh, are chasing those questions, but I don't feel. But qualified I think how, um, maybe uh, Lucinda Please. would hear from NRC maybe to help answer that question. I think it's it points to the importance of lithium and that course um, with the lithium battery and electric vehicles, which is what's driving the lithium demand increases that there will be more and more need for both lithium from rock and lithium from brine applications and so it's very important to to focus on that's why we did this webinar on lithium because of the increase in demand in lithium so um i guess we're just highlighting how important this commodity is to electrification and to um, some of the net zero targets that countries have um <clears throat> so lithium is one of those uh, battery metals as they as they call them so i guess it's just to, it's out of the scope of this webinar but to point to why we think um technologies that increase um the profitability of lithium mines is really important because of the importance of lithium itself in the green economy thanks lucinda Uh, it all depends on the objective. Certain sensors work well together. So for instance, for metal ores, it's uh, good to use X-ray transmission and uh, EM, which we didn't mention. But yeah, you can use uh, different sensors together. There are reasons why we do optical sorting uh, and for instance, laser sorting and infrared in the way that we do which means that they can't be in the same uh, configuration. Sometimes they just don't work well together. I think that there are, I think that our Australian office has, but I apologize, I'm not familiar, but perhaps someone at SRC has some experience there. I can, I can just mention that we can use E with a little bit of knowledge and the characterization. It's petalite from what? What do you want, actually want to sort your petalite from? You need both your waste as well as your commodity to actually be able to evaluate what kind of sensor and what kind of sorting methodology you're going to use. Um, I will take that. Uh, I will suggest that it is something that you should evaluate if it's of interest to you. And I apologize for being evasive, but that knowledge is uh, has to be acquired independently. One thing I would consider is the throughputs in potash are very, very high. So a first back of the napkin calculation would be uh, is the throughput of the sorter going to actually achieve the business objective that you're trying to? But uh, if there's a circumstance that, that makes sense from a business standpoint, I would definitely encourage you to try that. And that's as, that's as far as I can go. Jane, I think you might have some comments on that. 
the potash. So, you, so that would be the sorting for, um, you, you, get, you don't get, um, what we've done is we don't get full sorting, but whatever your rejects, if you do it underground, then you can leave it underground. So I think your question is, can the technology be used underground? Is that the, kind of like the question? If that's the case, then it's already being done uh, in several cases. I would say that has to be determined through test work. Uh, we can sort uh, up to a minimum of about six millimeters with an X-ray sorter. However, uh, there is one that goes down to about one millimeter. Uh, this is one that actually is on site at SRC. At this time, it's used for fine diamond recovery, and it's down in the stage of one to two millimeters. Any, any comment there, Mike? I think with the with the fine sorter, um, we are achieving diamond recovery below two millimeters, uh, down to one point seven. Uh, but there, you've got high contrasting. Uh, minerals where it's a high contrast, uh, low density mineral with the diamonds and, and the high density material with the, the dense media separation concentrate. Uh, and so that lends itself to, to a slightly easier uh, uh, program for, for, for sorting. Um, but now it's a matter of whether or not those applications translate into other commodities. Uh, the, the sacrifices you make with, with fine sorting is throughput. Uh, down below two millimeters, uh, you're down to less than a ton an hour. Uh, so it, uh, it's just a factor of how many sorters you would actually need to put in to, to achieve a, a sustainable uh, process. I've seen every, <laughs> every imaginable way of uh, washing material at different sites. Obviously, it has to be a climate zone where that can be achieved. So you do need a wash plant. You can recycle the, the water. So it doesn't have to be clean water, but it just has to be clean enough to see the surface. Uh, there is a case in Canada where they do not wash the material. Uh, they're using color plus near infrared. And to be perfectly honest, I'm amazed that it works. Uh, there is another site in Canada where They've discovered that once it gets cold enough, it doesn't matter because the material on the surface breaks off anyway. So my answer is it should be evaluated in a case-by-case -case basis, basis, but it, the, the best way is probably on a washing screen. So, uh, I'm, I'm not a geologist, but those sounded like high iron content material. So as, John, as Jane pointed out, if the material we're trying to sort it from uh, is not a high iron content mineral, uh, so like a silica-based material, there's a very nice contrast between atomic density contrast between iron content material and silica-based material. So I would say there's a good chance of determining that. Uh, that would that would be a good case where SRC's evaluation would uh, definitely help evaluate that. Any other comment, Jane? I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, yeah, what, what are the characteristics of what you want um, compared to what is the, the waste rock? And actually, you know, that's the first geological question. What is it that you want and what are its characteristics and what does the waste not have? And then that's the criteria that we find a sensor to utilize to actually sort the material. So there is a, uh, there's an operating plant in Canada that does use NIR. So yes, it is definitely a possibility. Uh, these days, I would look at both uh, color near infrared and using near infrared lasers. 
So the answer to that question is yes, it's worth evaluating. So the product is, a, is an off the shelf uh, piece of equipment. And again, we showed it's in various configurations, various sensors, depending on the application. Uh, again, uh, it just, we just need to understand what these alkali minerals are and what we're trying to separate them from. Uh, it sounds like this is an industrial minerals kind of thing. So economics are gonna be critical. You know, can we make the separation at, a, at an economic throughput and achieve the specifications? I know it sounds like I'm avoiding the question, but uh, there are too many details to answer it without knowing more details. We did present one. Uh, obviously, sometimes customers aren't keen on sharing those examples, but uh, if someone contacts us, we can try to see if they're interested, if the customer is interested in sharing. Um, Bias, I'd also like to just quickly Please. comment on, on that. Um, so the reason that SRC does the test work methodology that Mike outlined is so that we can help you answer those questions early on with not a lot of sample. So um, we will hopefully be able to answer whether you can potentially upgrade it um, and by how much looking at which mineral assemblage using a small amount of representative sample. Um, and so that's one of the ways we're hoping to, that doesn't answer your questions about sort of performance, but it does help answer the questions about whether sorting makes a difference uh, in your flow sheet early on. So that's the, the reason why we have developed this test work methodology to try and help answer those questions as early as possible. Thank you for the great questions. Please uh, feel free to follow up with us afterwards for more detailed answers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.